Good morning. Today we continue our year-long Democracy 2018 interviews with the candidates for Michigan governor. This morning, we shine our spotlight on two Republicans, one an aerospace engineer and the other a physician who specializes in delivering babies. State Senator Patrick Kobeck of Canton and Dr. Jim Hines of Saginaw, who has never before run for political office. We begin in alphabetical order with Patrick Kobach. It's Sunday, May the 20th. I'm Chuck Stokes, and this is Spotlight. Senator, hey, great to be with you, Chuck. In. Good to see you. Um, all right, let me ask you. Uh, at times, yeah. uh, in the legislature and on the campaign trail, you've been a little bit of a lightning rod for controversy. Yeah. How can you say, I'm going to run for governor, unite the people, yeah. when, in a real sense, you're creating division? Well, ultimately, I think people get united around the truth. And so everything that I've created as, as you term it, a lightning rod has actually been highlighting the truth of different situations, whether it was on the roads, where I highlighted that it was a bait and switch from the beginning when they were pushing for those tax increases and we could fix the roads without increasing taxes because as soon as they pass that tax increase without the vote of the people, they put $400 million out, they transferred it from the transportation budget to go backfill potholes and Medicaid expansion and other priorities. So yeah, they, that ruffles feathers when you actually tell people the truth, but you know, I believe that's my responsibility to make sure people are informed. They oftentimes say hindsight is 2020. Yeah. Uh, having seen some of the controversy, whether it's with your Republican <sighs> colleagues in yeah. the legislature and them taking action to sort of penalize you, yeah. um, or whether it's uh, with a Democratic opponent, uh, Abdul El Sayed, yeah. would you do anything differently? No, actually no. And, and I want to point out too with the El Sayed, I didn't bring that up as a campaign issue. He did with Dawood Walid out at CARE and their friends out at BuzzFeed. They made it a national issue. And I, it was very clear that I was talking about Muslim Brotherhood, and he's made it into a much different statement, and I've been called every name in the book, except people have not focused on uh, what I actually said. And the concerns with the Muslim Brotherhood are real, and I think they need to be addressed, and he needs to be asked and held accountable for his associations with them. The right. mistake I mean, that I made was father, it's his father-in-law, not his father. And so, okay, in-law versus not an in-law, but uh, frankly, Marrying into that is kind of more of a concern. And frankly, he's also got the association with the Muslim Students Association. That is a concern. If you actually dig into what they do, he's a vice president. So this is not like he was just uh, showing up to meetings. He was actually driving the agenda. And they've had Al Qaeda speakers, Al Qaeda leaders come in and speak at Muslim students events, not necessarily in his chapter, but they've had that across the, the country. They've had uh, um, terrorists that have actually come out of that Muslim Students Association. It is not. It is not a, I know it's got the keyword Muslim in it, but just because it's, it's a political organization, so it's the Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, that's what he needs to be held accountable. I'm, I, uh, as I said on the, at the Michigan Press Association, I love all Muslims. This isn't an issue of racism and bigotry like some people are, are attempting to, uh, to cast it as, because that's kind of the last resort of intellectually bankrupt, right? They go off and just cast dispersions up, uh, upon you. Um, this is a function of highlighting association to somebody whose um, uh, professed goal is to actually undermine our system of government. It is a political organization, not a religious organization, and then he needs to be held accountable. And you remember the words that he said uh, out of the Michigan Press Association? And we had 150 members of the press out there, and what did he do? At the end of this, he said, you may, you may uh, not hate Muslims, he said, he but... He said Muslims. Yeah, yeah, you. please, because this is actually, this is very important. He said, you may not hate Muslims, but uh, I can tell you that uh, definitely all Muslims hate you. you. Really, we need to zero in on real, where the real hate speech is. He hasn't been held accountable for that. The chair of the Michigan Democratic Party, he called you a pathetic, bigoted fool. Yep. And uh, the, communications, the communications director for the Michigan Republican Party, uh, they distanced themselves from you and yep. said that uh, race has no place in this campaign. Well, we could dig into some of the reasons why they may have said that. I would submit that they're, I'm not their favorite candidate, and so uh, anything they can do to shine a light in that context. Let's just say that there's a swamp in Lansing as much as there's a swamp in D.C. Um, it's also why I wrote a book on the whole topic. I want to make sure people understand what's really going on. It's called Wrestling Gators, and um, it really has been kind of frustrating over the last eight years because 
I go, I, I am a little idealistic, and I will readily admit to that, that I think that our elected officials should be serving the best interests of the people, um, and then we should be seeking the truth in everything that we do. Some people do not have those as priorities. All right, we need to take a break. When we come back, I want to talk about some real issues uh, uh, that are important in this race. You, you've talked yeah. about job growth, how yep. you want to grow this state. You've talked about health care and a wide range of topics. Sounds we'll good. tackle those. We'll be right back with state senator and candidate for governor, Patrick Kobach. Say on your website, yep. first thing up there is you want to make Michigan the top job growth state. Yep. How are you going to do that? Uh, there's a lot of different ways. Number one, uh, we're going to start uh, paying attention to what the, what's in the best interest of our citizens. So, um, and number one priority for uh, along those lines is to eliminate the state personal income tax and the senior pension tax right along with it. Um, when we talk about economic development incentives right now, traditionally what's happened, whether uh, it's uh, big government advocates in the Republican Party or big government advocates in the Democratic Party, they use uh, Economic Development Corporation to go off and use taxpayer dollars to go off and pick winners and losers. And they, they try to use state funds, i.e. I taxpayer funds, as a venture capitalist fund. And I have a different approach. I want to give it back to the people who actually do make a difference. All those small business owners that are passed through entities that get taxed at the personal income tax rate, they're going to see an economic development incentive with the elimination of personal income tax. And also, I've got plans to lower the cost of health care. We're free market health care solutions that are nationally recognized. If you go to Forbes.com, you can see some of the most popular articles they have on health care were written by me up there. And then you can also look at pursuing energy choice, where we can actually give people an opportunity to lower the cost of their energy here in the state by getting back to an unregulated market, or, or at least uh, not fully regulating, tell people who are customers. So if you lower the cost of government, you lower the cost of health care, you lower the cost of uh, energy. Now you got, you're lowering the cost of three major contributors to the expense by, uh, line on a lot of business operations, and that treats all businesses equally. It, I've got a track record of doing what's in the best interest of the people, whether or not it hurts me politically or not. And uh, ultimately, Michigan Chamber is all about control. You did not support the Republican governor of this state when he wanted to expand uh, Medicaid. Yep. Um, yeah. your, your wife is a, a pediatric physician, yep. so uh, uh, you've got med medical care close to home Absolutely, in there. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, your stance on what would be best in terms of health care for this state? Well, my opposition to most issues, and like uh, Medicaid expansion, i.e. Healthy Michigan, was, uh, was also supported by me providing an alternative. So I don't just simply say no, I actually say here's a better way of going off and doing it. And in the case of healthcare, you've got two ways of expanding access to care for people. One is you take money from one group of people and use it to subsidize the cost of high health, uh, high, high cost healthcare for another group. The other is to lower the cost of providing healthcare for everybody. I took the latter approach and actually we're implementing a pilot right now uh, that's going to help Medicaid uh, enrollees uh, called the Direct Primary Care Medicaid Pilot. It's going to launch on July 1st, finally, after about a year of dragging their feet out at the department at, in the state of Michigan. And that's got an opportunity to save over 20% on delivery of care by giving them better care. Um, and uh, it's really a great opportunity. That's what I focus is on, better ways of delivering health care. If you focus on preventive care, which is what my solution actually does, you keep them out of the expensive part of health care, which is um, the hospitalization and chronic illnesses. Now, you can imagine there's a lot of lobbyists inside of Lansing that depend upon getting that gravy train going to them. So, of course, I'm going to rub against them as well. You voted against the road repair plan. Yeah. You want to cut taxes. How are you going to pay for improving our infrastructure if you make all these cuts. Where's the money gonna come from? You know, when I first got elected into office, they send you in this little legislative boot camp, and the solution to every single problem in that legislative boot camp was to increase taxes or fees. That simply doesn't work in the real world. And uh, they do it because they have a lot of lobbyists that make money based on how much money they can bring in for their clients. When it comes to roads and comes to infrastructure, you need to start focusing on quality. I've talked to a lot of folks out in Ohio with the department uh, with the, that are representing their quality uh, roads out in Ohio. Whenever you talk to people about Michigan roads, they always compare it to Ohio. I know what they do differently. So and you they, say there's enough money, we just start using the money. best materials? No, we're not just, uh, the, there's a lot of variables that go into concrete pavement, 
yeah, the weather has to be right, the humidity has to be right, all this kind of stuff. Apparently, we don't measure up for that. And uh, we can make roads that actually last longer with existing funds. I call it a, a case of converting from version one lousy roads to version two high quality roads that last three to four times as long. I've got materials that we can use to go off and promote that. Um, there is a way to go off and do it, but everybody's so focused on the funding part and not focused on the quality part that uh, I, if I, I've demonstrated time and time again, if you focus in on the quality, you can actually spend less money on roads, not more, after you've converted them all high quality you, roads. Would you champion some type of legislation to be able to cut back on the weight of the rigs that run up and down our Michigan roads? Listen, if I spec out a road to say that I'm supposed to last 50 years under a certain uh, load profile, then I sure as heck be, better be able to go off and have a road that lasts 50 years subject to that road, load profile. So if we're going off and specking a 20 year design, which is our current default right now for a lot of these roads, and they're not lasting, and we're saying it's subject to the current load profiles we have, well, that's a problem. That's an issue with quality. That's not an issue with the weight of the trucks. So we need to hold people accountable. I've actually got legislation that's been stalled for a long time that would actually provide transparency around who designed it, who built it, who inspected it, what's the design life on it, what were the load profile assumptions on it, and it's not getting movement because of pushback from the lobbyists uh, that don't want to have that sort of transparency. Well, if Senator Kobeck has captured your attention, there's a lot more. I'll continue my lengthy interview with Senator Kobeck on our website. Go to WXYZ.com to hear what he wants to do for the state of Michigan. Coming up here on air, Dr. Jim Hines. We'll be right back. Doctor, welcome to Spotlight. Hey, thank you. It's always a pleasure to have you. Um, all right, on your website, it says, I put people first, not politics. You've delivered hundreds, thousands of babies. Right, but thousands. Have, yeah, but you have never run for any kind of public office. Right. What in the world makes you think you can run a big bureaucratic state like Michigan? So just because I haven't been a politician and run for office doesn't mean I don't have leadership ability, executive ability. So for over the last, uh, I would say 30 years, I've been involved in leading boards and committees and so forth. I'm the former chief of the medical staff of Covenant Healthcare, which has over 530 doctors on the staff, and also the former president of the Christian Medical and Dental Association with over 18,000 members. Um, and to boot, I'm a small business owner, past president of our corporation, and so I have a, a lot of national experience, but also international experience because I lived and worked in a country called the Central African Republic for four years where I ran two large hospitals and 20 urgent care facilities. But why stop it, start at the very top? Uh, well, why not something a little lower just to kind of learn how politics works, the inner workings of politics, the give and take of politics, so that when you get to that top rung, you're totally ready for that legislative branch, which they feel as though they're equal branch of government. Mm. Well, they are. All three branches are equal. Um, it's because I want to make the biggest impact that I possibly can. Uh, we've made a lot of progress with Snyder. Uh, we still have a ways to go, and I believe that I have the leadership ability to take the state to the next level. And what I see happening in Lansing and across this state is we've, we've gotten things confused. Instead of putting people first, what I see leadership doing is they're putting lobbyists and special interest groups and bureaucrats and even the interest of the politician themselves before the people. And my experience for 38 years as a doctor is to put people first. And uh, so it's a perfect fit. Certainly medical issues become a key part of the uh, the policy debate in Lansing and in Washington. Let's take some of them. Uh, Medicaid expansion. Uh, if you had been in the legislature at the time that was being debated, how would you have voted? And do you think that Governor Rick Snyder took the correct course of action? You know, it's hard to know what you would have done back then. What I have seen, though, is that it's not working across the state. And what I see is I see hundreds of my patients, instead of coming to the doctor to see me, where the care is going to be the cheapest, mm -hmm. they're still going to the emergency room, which is the highest cost. So 
time and time again, I'll say, well, you know, why did you go to the emergency room? Well, because the office wasn't opened. And so this last year, we actually started nighttime hours to bring those patients back into the office. So um, Medicaid expansion has been very expensive and it really, frankly, it just hasn't worked. So if you get elected governor, you'll have to deal with that issue in some form. What changes, if any, would you make and would you try to roll some of the things back that are already in place? I like the idea of encouraging able-bodied people to work because I think that opens a lifetime of opportunities. And so with Healthy Michigan and even our Medicaid system, we do have individuals that are completely able-bodied mentally and physically that could be working. We need to encourage them to work. And right now we have a, a, a shortage. Our unemployment rate is as low as it's been for years. and employers are screaming for workers and we don't have workers and so we need to accommodate those able-bodied people many of whom have given up trying to get a job because they just weren't able to find one if you become governor do you like what you see happening in washington in terms of the trump administration and what they're trying to do with what the affordable care act or some people like to call it obamacare um, because what they're trying to do will impact the state of Michigan. Yes, I, you know, I, I support free market health care. Free market health care is a health care that's transparent. Uh, there's competition, there's choice. Right now, there's no transparency. So uh, if you need a CAT scan, for example, or some sort of uh, procedure, and you call two separate hospitals, you will not find out how much they're going to charge you, even though the charge may be thousands of dollars different. I, I believe that the citizens of the state, they, they need to know what things cost. This is how our society functions. The consumer gets to make a choice based upon what the cost is and they look at the quality and so forth. And I think transparency will increase the quality of our care. We need accessible, affordable, really good, high quality health care. All right, we need to take a little break. We'll come back, pick up on a couple more medical issues, but also talk about how you're going to create jobs if elected governor of this great state. We'll be right back with Dr. Jim Hines. Stay with us. <laughs> Doctor, there's going to be on the ballot uh, people to be able to say whether or not they want recreational use of marijuana. Oh, that's a hot stand? topic. Where do you stand on this? Oh, wow. Let me let me talk about medical marijuana first because okay. I have I have dozens of patients. Or against that. Medical marijuana, I support it. Okay. And the main reason I support it is because I have seen it over and over again work in my patients to the point where patients that have been on three to five different medications, mm -hmm. they use the CDP, CDP part of it and uh, they can go off all of those medications. Recreate, but, but, you know, I think it needs to be better regulated. It's not regulated very well. Recreational marijuana is a different story. Um, we don't know what the proper dose is. We don't know about the interaction with other medication. We don't know what the instance of lung cancer is with inhaled marijuana. There's so many things that we don't know. Research needs to be done. So you'll vote against it? I would vote against it. But if the citizens of the state vote for it, then we'll deal with it. Uh, we need to be sure that our school bus drivers are not on marijuana. We need to know that our, our police officers know how to, to deal with somebody that's driving under the influence. And so there, there, there's some issues that need to be uh, looked at. Uh, there are memory issues with marijuana and uh, the desire to work is often not there in patients that are on high doses of marijuana. So there's a whole slew of things that needs to be looked at, and I think research needs to be done. Uh, opioid epidemic, uh, what should we do to combat that? Opioids, it's crazy. You know, I think the first thing is we need to save lives and we need to get people into treatment. We need to make sure that doctors are not over prescribing, that they're prescribing, uh, if it's not an opioid, something that can substitute that's not addictive. Uh, we need to be able to track uh, at pharmacies and with doctors to make sure patients are not getting two and three prescriptions for, from different providers. To save lives, uh, naloxone is the antidote. That needs to be available everywhere. 
The, 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 to me, though, the biggest issue with the opioids is that we have somebody that's addicted. You cannot just stop opioids just like that. And so if you decrease the amount of opioids available to a population that has had free access of opioids, then they move on to something else because they're addicted. And so we may even see an increase, an uptick of the death rate related to the opioid epidemic because we're removing the opioids that you can get from prescription and patients and individuals are going to heroin and fentanyl. We, in this state, we need physicians and healthcare providers that can counsel, because it takes about a year or two of counseling and a substitution of other medications to get these patients really off their opioid addiction. If you get elected, will you do something very, very different to the state health department to make sure that we don't have another Flint? Absolutely. You know, when I was in Africa, we drilled wells for village people. And when, when the water came up stinky and brown, we didn't try to convince the people that the water was okay to drink. We capped it, we drilled another well. You know, common sense. One of the things that's happened in Flint is we've spent over $23 million in prosecution and defense and have very little to show for it. That's taxpayer money. That's taxpayer money. Um, so with Flint water, we need to get those water lines changed out because we know that in the process of changing out the lines, there's an influx of lead into the system that gets into the neighbor's house. So that's a separate issue, but we have over 7,000 toxic sites here in the state that many of them are just sitting there leaching chemicals, uh, PFAS and, and other chemicals into our groundwater. That has to be addressed. How will you create jobs as governor and what taxes will you increase and decrease? The way that we build businesses is by keeping taxes and regulations and spending under control. Under control. Not by increasing taxes, that hurts businesses, that causes them to not grow, but when we keep taxes and regulations under control, businesses can thrive. When we decrease taxes, they can thrive even more. They can buy that extra piece of equipment, they can hire that extra employee that they can increase salaries and so I, I think the key is keeping taxes and regulations under control and some have said well let's get rid of our income tax or let's decrease our income tax from 4.25 to 3.9 and, and I and I'm for that but we've got to get the roads fixed okay the roads are terrible and then there's that so does that mean a tax increase I in addition to what we've already appropriate I think that we can fix our roads without increasing our taxes but we've got to be very focused. We have, we're talking about $350 million left over, we call that lapse funds from this last fiscal year. And everybody's kind of putting their two cents in. We need to use that money and fix our roads. Uh, extra money left over from the general fund. Let's fix our roads. Like the Republican candidate before him, now go to our WXYZ.com to see and hear my entire interview with Dr. Jim Hines. He talks about several more important issues. We thank both candidates for spending time with us on air here today. I'm Chuck Stokes. We'll be back next week with more newsmakers in the spotlight. We hope you have a great week.